So this is Randy Frazee, and um, he has come this evening to, uh, to talk about leaving a legacy and the primary most important things uh, that we can do to invest in our children, in our grandchildren, as we invest and think about the family unit, uh, what is most important, what is most primary. And, and you will be greatly encouraged as you hear his story of the way that, that God has wired him and shaped him and spoken to him and formed his family and ministry. And so he's going to pour into us this evening. Um, he's going to prime the pump. He's going to get you really excited. And then I have the privilege of coming up at the very end and telling you <clears throat> some areas of where we're going to go as a church, uh, some this summer and some uh, where we're going and, and what we're going to offer in the fall. So with that, you guys give an awesome First Baptist Bernie welcome to Randy Frazee. Well, good evening, everybody. It is great to see you. So uh, my sister asked me to speak a few months ago and gave me the basic idea of what she wanted me to talk on, something I'm super passionate about. Uh, but then last week, uh, I was in California, and I saw this, and I saw the title of what I'm actually going to be speaking on, uh, which is, what's the greatest thing you can give your kids? And so I want to answer that question tonight to be faithful to what you came for and also speak on what my sister asked me to speak on. Okay? So what's the best thing you can give your kids based upon what the scripture says and what research says? So, so for those of you who love the scriptures and don't like science, uh, we got you. For those of you who like science and are skeptical of the scripture, got you, but they all come together and there's three recommendations. I'm going to give you the first two up front because I'm uh, going to spend most of my time on the third one. You got it? Three things. The first thing that you can do, the greatest thing for your kids is for your kids to know that you are unashamedly and undeniably in love with each other. If your kids know that, you have done the very best thing for them because they are relying on you for security. And so you should make out in front of your kids. You should let them know that you're madly in love. And if they don't leave the room soon, yeah, it's going to get hot. So if you need to, a lot of times parents think, you know, our, our number one focus is in our kids. If my four grown kids were in the room today, we told them all along, you are not the number one priority in our life. God's number one, and then mom's number two for me, and then you're number three, and that's the way you want it. Because I'm a better father to you if God and my marriage are solid. Because what they want more than anything is to know that we're in love. Now, sometimes that doesn't work out. Some of you may be single in the room. You may be divorced. And my response to you is then what you need to do, number one, is to make sure you don't live your life bitter towards your ex, whether you started it or they started it, you gotta make sure your kids don't see you living a life of bitterness, right? Number two, if you're a single mother and you have a son, you need to make sure he has spiritual uncles and grandparents, if not grandparents, you gotta get boys around men. You gotta do that. Okay, so there is assignment number one, whether you're married or if some tragedies happen in your life and you're divorced. Number two, research shows, scripture backs it up. The number one thing for, you can do for your kids comes out of Columbia University, a study they did. And they found out the number one thing you can do if you want your chi children to avoid drugs, alcohol, smoking, and premarital sex. Anybody interested in your kids avoiding those things? Give me an amen. amen. Drugs, alcohol, smoking, and sex. You don't want your kids into that, right? So what's the number one thing you can do? Have meals with them, dinner with them five nights a week. Not one, not two, not three, not four, but five. And you're saying, you don't understand, we have sports. There is no research on the planet that will show that your children will get the get best gift if you have them in sports. So our kids were in sports, but sports have to work around dinner. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. I, okay, I got a little, a little, some of the younger families like, I don't know about that. It's true. And so it's on you if you don't follow it, right? You guys like it straight? Okay, the number... 
three, which is what my sister wanted me to speak on. I'm gonna tell a story first and then I'm gonna to get to it, is that all right? So I'm gonna go back to when I was a kid, all right? So uh, I grew up with my sister in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, uh, our parents uh, were not believers in Jesus. Uh, they weren't against Jesus. We even had the blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus in the dining room. I'm pretty sure he didn't look like that, but it was in our dining My parents, uh, Jesus just didn't make the short list of priorities in their life. And I think most of the people that you probably know that are not into church, they're not into God. It's not that they're atheist. Uh, it's because they just don't have time. But there were two spiritual deposits in my life. The first came in the form of a ceramic prayer plaque that uh, was given to me and it hung over my bed. And I said the prayer every night. And I want you to put your hands together and say it with me if you know it. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Mm. Let me ask you a question. What kind of sick person writes a prayer like that for kids? Every night I went to bed, it wasn't sugar plums dancing in my head. Every night I went to bed, I thought this could be it for me. And, and what are the chances that the Lord's gonna take me? My parents don't even go to church, right? So it's a scary plaque. The second one came in the form of a Bible that my grandmother gave to me and to my younger sister, Teresa. Mine was the black synthetic leather, King James version of the Bible, red letter edition with the cross zipper on it. My sister's was white. She lost hers. Oh, you do have it. Okay, my sister does have the very first Bible that we got. And uh, even as a kid, with my parents not going to church, there was a hallway between our two bedrooms. We didn't have but two bedrooms. One was my parents and one was ours, right? And there was a bookshelf in there and that's where this Bible sat. And in the summertime, when everybody was outside, no air conditioning, you could go into that hallway and if you were quiet, you could almost hear it breathe. And there was something that would draw me to it. And on numerous occasions, I would take it out and I would unzip in it, and I would open it up. I'd lay on the floor, I'd tuck my palms under my chin, I'd fold my legs up and crisscross them, and I would begin to read. And I would read, and I would read, and I would read. Then I'd close it up, zip in it back up, put it on the bookshelf, and go back to playing. I read it, but I didn't get it. Can I get an amen? The Bible is a very difficult book to read. Uh, as a matter of fact, a recent research shows that the average American family owns four Bibles, but 41% of them profess to never reading it. George Gallup said the Bible is the best-selling book of all times, but it apparently doesn't have a best-selling impact on our life. Now, why is that? Because as a pastor, now I have to probe, what is it that's keeping people from the scriptures? And what we determine, it's not from a lack of desire. Research tells us that the average person, not just the person at First Baptist Church, but your neighbors who don't go to church have reading through the Bible on their bucket list. That is one of the things they wanna do before they kick the bucket right? Right up there with climbing Mount Everest or diving out of an airplane is reading through the Bible. And for many people, the first two seems much more accessible than the third one. So what's the problem? So we've done some real drilling down on it. And what one of the things we've discovered is that the Bible is a story and people like stories, but the Bible is not organized as a story. The Bible's organized topically and not chronologically. So when you go to read it at the beginning of the year, Genesis through Revelation, you're gonna be fine in Genesis and Exodus. You're gonna get stuck. You're gonna get stuck in Leviticus. Skin diseases, woo, exciting stuff. It's a great book. Pastor's gonna start teaching on it this fall, he told me. No, that's not true. Because um, it's gonna take two years to do it. 
Genesis, Exodus, this. Numbers, pretty good. You're going to get to Deuteronomy and go like, didn't we already cover this? Deuteronomy means the second telling of the story, right? Then you're going to get all the way into this. The first 17 books are historical books. And you're going to read in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, the fall of David to Bathsheba chapter 11 and what he did to Uriah in chapter 12. And then you're going to get the poetic books over here. So the first 17 books are history books topically. Then you get the five um, poetic books. Let's see, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And then you're going to get 17 prophetic books, five major, 12 minor. So here's the deal. When you read 2 Samuel chapter uh, 11 and 12, and you see the fall of David, it would have been so nice if you could have, or someone told you to skip over to Psalm chapter 51, where David is confessing and coming clean with God. That would read better as a story, but the Bible has been organized topically and not chronologically. So pick your best novel writer. I loved in the day, Robert Ludlum. Some of the guys know Robert Ludlum, if you're familiar with his series, the Born Identity series, you remember that? And they're very complex novels. It would be like starting on page 341 of a Robert Ludlum novel. And that's how many people enter into the scripture. They have no idea who the characters are, where things have been, where things are going. And people are very confused about that. So the Bible is not, is a story, but it's not organized as a story. And that has really confused people. And another thing we know is that people need to do this in community. People need to do this in community. So we study, what does it make uh, for you to break a habit or to start a brand new habit that's good? And the research tells us this, for example, if you desire to quit smoking and you try to do it on your own, your statistical chances of success are a big fat zero, statistically. If you add a, a tool like a nicotine patch your chances of success inch up to about 5%. But if with the tool you will add community, your chances skyrocket to 40%, 40%. And not only do you need to do this in community, but you need to do it in community with your kids. They need to be on the same page as you. So if you're off studying something else and they're off studying something else and this kid's studying something else, you're not on the same page. So here's, here's two things that we've learned. There's a study out called Reveal that I was a part of. It's the largest single study, the largest single study uh, that's done on the church, uh, 700,000 people and counting who have been asked, where are you at in your spiritual life and what has catalyzed you to your next step and how is your church doing in helping you get there? And uh, the research has come back. It has never changed. There are two major learnings, two major learnings. Number one, the number one catalyst for spiritual growth is Bible engagement with no close second. In the research, the second Place one was way down here. That very seldom happens in research. If someone wants to grow in their relationship with God, the single greatest thing they can do is engage in scripture. Whether you're exploring Christ, you're growing in Christ, you're close to Christ or Christ surrendered, wherever you're at on the continuum, your best way to get to the next step in closeness to Christ is by engaging scripture. The second learnings in this research is this, the number one thing that people want from their church is to help them understand the Bible. So churches get involved in all this fancy stuff and, uh, and at the end of the day, the people like, man, we came to church to understand the word of God. And let's give it up for Pastor Jason. Man, that guy can bring the word. Come on, let's give it up for Pastor Jason. The guy can do it. That was awkward, wasn't it? At best. Another study that has been done, the scriptures is going to prove this, is that We want our kids to grow closer to God, right? We want our grandkids to go closer to God, right? There's nothing that matters to me as a grandparent 
more than that. We want them to go there. So here is what research tells us. Research tells us if you want your kids to know God, if you want your grandkids to know God, they need to be in his word. And if they're going to be in his word, the best person they want to receive it from is you. Do you hear that? So my sister leads the children's ministry here, right? Woohoo! And she's awesome. My sister has more leadership in her little finger than I have in my entire body. And she's recruiting volunteers. And she tells me about the class A volunteers that you guys have. I've met a couple of them. They're like a step above. And it's really awesome when a volunteer will come alongside of a kid. But the research tells us that the kid would rather have their mom and dad or grandparents do it. So you say, but I'm nowhere near as good as these trained volunteers or professionals. The kid says, I don't care. I want to see my dad open up the Bible. I want to see my dad pray with me. And he can bumble along and not be able to pronounce any of the names. He doesn't even have to know the right interpretation. Something is being picked up when a mom and a dad and a grandmother and a grandfather sit down with their kids and get into the scriptures. And you supplement it. So in case you make some mistakes along the way, you supplement it with the pros. An A volunteer can never hold a candle to a parent or a grandparent coming alongside of their kid with a B or C approach. You can be a B or C and still the A volunteer will never, never be able to match viscerally what your parents can do. Uh, now my sister and I, did not have that. And if you ask, ask my sister and I, we would have given anything, given anything for that to happen. We never had it happen for us. But it's turned out okay. We're both in ministry, but we would have loved it. And so a word to volunteers. Volunteers were all that I had where all my sister had. I call your attention to a guy named Randy Taylor who helped me to memorize scripture. And he taught me what it means to be a Christian man. And I know him now, he wasn't that much older than me. And he's just a normal everyday average guy, but he came alongside and I picked it up. Or I call your attention to Ray Teeter, a bit of an older man. But one day when I was 15 years old, Ray Teeter in the lobby of the church grabbed me by the shoulders and he said, Randy, you would make a good pastor. I had never had a single person ever see anything in me, anything. And I said, you think I could do that? And he goes, you absolutely could. And from that day, I set my focus. God, if you will help me, that's what I'll do. And that's all I've ever done. And so I don't want to underestimate the value of a volunteer for those of us that that's all we had. But the A plan is for you guys to get involved. And Moses knew this. Matter of fact, in the last chapter of Deuteronomy, the second telling of the law, he knows that the children of Israel are going to hedge on their faith commitment as soon as he dies. And he knows he's about ready to die. And so his final act is to set down a plan. And I'm going to read it. We're going to put it on the scriptures. Deuteronomy 31 verses 9 through 13. So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years in the year of canceling deaths, during the festival of tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. Assemble the people. Read it out loud with me. Assemble the people. Ready? Men, women, and children, and the foreigners residing in your towns, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Who was to be assembled to hear the word? Men, women, and children, and foreigners. 
Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So every seven years, all the men, women, and children were to come together and to hear and to read the word of God together. And this would be the secret sauce of Israel's success. But you probably know the story. They very seldom followed it. And every time they went years without following it, they found themselves in bondage. They found themselves in bondage, but you will see throughout the story, study it for yourself. You'll see throughout the story with Joshua and Josiah and Nehemiah and Ezra. Every time the people hit rock bottom, good spiritual leaders would gather together the men, the women, and the children, and they would together they would take in the word of God and it would lead every single time to repentance, confession, and revival. Let me just tell you one of the stories. You're probably familiar with it. So, so um, Israel's in the divided kingdom. There's Israel to the north, Judah to the south. And the Judah to the south uh, installs a king by the name of Josiah, who is eight years old eight years old. Okay, I got installed as a senior pastor of a church when I was 28. I thought that was irresponsible. I can't imagine how irresponsible it was to put an eight-year-old in charge of Judah, the, the, the people who was going to bring us the Messiah. But after careful study of the 40 kings they had during that period between Israel and Judah, only five of them were good kings and Josiah was one of those good kings. Never, never underestimate, never, never underestimate the spiritual capacity of a kid to do what adults won't do. So fast forward, Josiah's 22 years old and he sends his scribe, one of his guys over to the temple to retrieve some money to pay the workers who were renovating the temple. And so when the guy goes to the temple, the priest takes him, goes into the storage to get the money and he comes out with the money and a book. And he says, uh, we also found this book in storage. It was the Bible. It was the Torah. The Bible got lost in the temple. So the scribe takes it back to Josiah, now 22 years of age. And he said, hey, the priest said they found this book (laughs) in storage. And Josiah said, read it to me. And so the scribe began to read to Josiah the story. And it says that Josiah began to weep and he tears his clothes off, sackcloth and ashes. And from that, he led Israel to their greatest revival ever. When people know the word of God, they're set up for the greatest amount of success. Joshua said it, right? Joshua said it. I meditate on this law day and night. And that, my friends, is what will prove to make me successful. We want our kids to be successful. Then we must get them into the word. The pattern of scripture to get them into the word is for us to do it together. Men, women, and men, women, and children. And I know that is what First Baptist Church wants. It's why I've been brought here to help, to contribute, to stimulate. And your pastor is going to stand up and tell you some of the plans that they have to execute on this strategy. This is the best thing, number three, that you can do for your children. Get your children into the word of God with you. Number three. So back to my story, if you don't mind me closing on my story. So fast forward, um, I'm now 14 years of age and uh, a neighbor that worked with my father, two doors down from us in East Cleveland, invited me and my younger, I've told this story several times but my sister has very seldom been in the audience, uh, invited us to their summer vacation Bible school. And uh, we had nothing else going on and, uh, and my parents apparently agreed because we wouldn't have been able to go otherwise. And uh, so I was excited. Vacation Bible School started on Monday and uh, we were all ready to go. And when uh, my neighbor pulled up, I was expecting him to pull up in his wood paneled station wagon, but instead he pulled up in a church bus. 
The year is 1974. Yeah, that, some of you are familiar with that. Matter of fact, I was just with this gentleman. He's 89 years old, and he brought a picture of the church bus that we got picked up on. So if anybody you remembered bus ministry, and I freaked out. Teresa went. I did not go. I was super shy. She came home that night and said, it was a lot of fun. You should go. So I went back on Tuesday night. And for the very first time, I heard what Jesus did for me. I'm 14 years old. And I think, I think I understand this. I think I understand this. I think I have a little bit more time than normal. So I'll tell you the first time I heard it, I was in now in junior high at 14 and the youth pastor, Larry Way said, everyone bow your head and close your eyes. And he said, I want to ask you a question. If you were to die tonight, do you know for sure you would go to heaven? And I thought, there's, I got this one. There's no way a person should be arrogant enough to think that they would go to heaven. There's no way. And so I peeked. I was the only one with my hand up. And I thought, I am either the brightest student in the class on my very first night, or I'm missing something. And then he asked the question, how many of you were to die tonight would know for sure you would go to heaven? And I peeked, everybody's hands was up. So I thought, wow, went to big church, heard the same thing. It was overwhelming, overwhelming uh, for me uh, to hear this. Now, uh, this was um, um, a, a challenging time because everything that they told us um, was centered around the imminent return of Christ, okay? In the 70s, everything, every message was all about the rapture. Okay, now you know what I'm talking about. The imminent return of Christ, that Christ is gonna return at any moment and you better be ready. So back in the 70s, there was uh, movies and there were, there were songs, uh, the cross and the switchblade. Does anybody remember those? Some of the older people in here, cross and the switchblade. You remember the song? Two men walking up a hill, one disappears, but one's left standing still. I wish we had all been ready. And I thought to myself, wow, this is pretty intense. And they never said it explicitly, but they did say it implicitly. I got the distinct impression that Jesus was coming back on Friday at the end of vacation Bible school. I absolutely did. I thought he was coming back Friday. I'm like, wow, man, I got in under the wire. This is incredible. What if I had said no? I mean, the whole world's coming to an end. Whew, lucky me. So I have to figure this all out. So I go back on Wednesday to make sure I heard the message right, and I did. And so I went home that night, and I knelt by our bunk beds, and I said the best prayer that I could muster up, and I finished Nothing. So I, I, well, I did everything I was supposed to do, but I'm not sure that it took. So I've got to go talk to a professional. So I have to decide, I'm either going to talk to the person on Thursday night or Friday night. So I chose Thursday night because I wasn't sure whether Jesus was coming back at the beginning of vacation Bible school on Friday or at the end. I don't want to chance it, man. Eternity is hanging in the balance for me. So um, the bus came to pick me up on Thursday and I decided who I was going to talk to. I decided to talk to Paul Villar. Why? Number one, he was the captain of my bus and I felt like I had developed a little bit of a relationship with him. So I wasn't as intimidated. And number two, they always quoted Paul in church. I beseech you, therefore, brother, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And, and they would always quote Paul in church. And he was the only Paul in the church. And they never used his last name. So I assumed it was him. I got like, every time I'm here, he's always up holding up the back wall. But he's the go-to guy. So I'm going to go to Paul. So after youth service, between youth service and big church, I went to Paul Villar, a portly Italian man, and I simply said, I want to receive Christ. 
And it turns out Paul didn't know whether to spit or to wind his watch. He wasn't prepared to help me with this. So he took me back to the youth pastor, Larry Way, who took me back onto the front row. He took me back to the front row. And the first question he asked me is, Randy, will you admit that you're a sinner? (laughs) I'm 14 years old and I'm in front of this like, iconic figure, this youth pastor, and I him hauled around. I go, well, you know, I'm, uh, he says, well, I'm a sinner. Oh, okay, I'm in, you know? And it was there that I said a more eloquent prayer. As I look back, I think actually Wednesday night was the night that I received Jesus because it doesn't take an eloquent prayer. It takes a willing heart, Right? So now Fridays are coming. So much to do on Friday, (laughs) lots to do. First of all, I got to decide women, what I'm gonna wear for all eternity, right? And so I had a red uh, sports jacket uh, with a country club emblem on it. Yeah, we were a blue collar family and uh, we didn't belong to a country club. But one of the messages I heard that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And I thought for sure there's a golf course in there somewhere. And it's time for me to give up on this lower middle class poverty thing. I'm wearing my country club to my new digs. And so I got all suited up. Uh, The second thing I had to do was say goodbye to my parents. You know, it's really, it's really hard, but I didn't know how to explain it to them. And so I remember leaving that night on the, I'd be like, mom, dad, dad goodbye. Yeah. I was like, wow, I just, I wish I had more time. So I got on the bus and we went to vacation Bible school. And then it came and it went and there's no Jesus. And I thought, Wow. I really misunderstood this. And so now I get back on the bus to go back home. The first awkward conversation was with my parents. Hello? (laughs) But then my first official act as a follower of Jesus was I went into my bedroom and I pulled down the ceramic prayer plaque and I edited it. Now I lay me down to sleep I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I know the Lord my soul he'll take. That's a great story, right? Okay, so now fast forward. Uh, This next month on June the 13th or the 14th, depending on when you you believe or Jesus believed I received him into my life, will be my 50th birthday. What I'm telling you happened 50 years ago next month. And it's when I became a protagonist in the story of God. And what I've learned over all of these 50 years, all he wants you to do is to align your life to the story he's telling. If you align your life to the story he's telling, then he promises to write a good story with your life. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. If you will but love God and align your life to the purpose he puts in front of you, he promises to write a good story with your life. It doesn't say all things work together for my good. It says all things work together for the good. You might have to go through a lot or you might not feel as though your life ended the way you wanted it. But if you align your life to the story of God, he will make something good of that. Does anybody want something good of their life? Yeah, I do too. So now he has had our stories collide. We call this the lower story. He's writing an upper story. And so why is it that my sister's here? And why is it that I'm here? And why is it that you're here? And so what you should be asking is, what's this all about? And how does he want our stories to collide in the days to come so that we might be able to lead more people to this place, particularly our children and our grandchildren. Now, Roseanne is my wife of 42 years. We met in that church when I was 15 years old. We began to sit together in church and hold hands. I'm the only one in the church that wanted the preacher to go on and on and on. And we got married 
And today we have four grown kids that all know Jesus. Amen. But what I didn't tell you is I'm now also a grandfather. Yeah, I have five grandchildren. First time I've ever been able to say that. I've got two here uh, in Bernie, which is why we've just purchased a home again back in Bernie, even though I'm the pastor of a church in Kansas City, because I want to be around my grandchildren. And then my son, my second oldest, uh, my uh, old, second oldest, my oldest son, and then his wife just brought home about two, three weeks ago, three beautiful children from Bulgaria. And on May the 23rd, we're going to go meet Gabriella, Anelia, and Joanna, our new grandkids who don't speak English. So pray for us. What could possibly go wrong? And I also gave Ava, my granddaughter, a Bible like my grandmother did, but there's a difference. When Ava opens up her Bible and lays on the floor and tucks the palms of her hands under her chin and folds up her leg and crisscrosses it to read her Bible, the difference is that her Baba, that's what she calls me, is on the floor with her. And that's all that we're talking about. Uh, A number of years ago, my daughter, without our permission, uh, took her little iPhone and took a video of me on the floor with my granddaughter, Ava. Would you like to see it? Okay, it's a little scratchy, but take a look. Chapter 24, Jesus the... Teacher. Teacher. Yay. Yay. Jesus told the people, love God and love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. A man asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus answered his question with a story. One day, a man was walking down the road. Suddenly, some robbers jumped out. They hit the man and stole everything that he had. No, he hit that man. That's right. And suddenly, they ran away, leaving him lying in the dirt. Soon, a priest came along, but he passed without helping him. Then, a leader of the church came along, but he didn't stop to help him either. Finally, a Samaritan came down the road. Is that Samaritan? Uh-huh. And he saw the injured man. He felt sorry for him and quickly jumped off of his donkey and ran over to help. The Samaritan bandaged the man's stores, put him on his donkey and took donkey and took him to an inn where he could get better. Then Jesus asked, Who was a neighbor to the injured man? The man replied, the Samaritan who helped him. Yep, yeah, Jesus said, be kind like that man. Now listen to this. Donkey, huh? man, Samaritan. Yep, Jesus told stories to teach people. You can learn from Jesus' stories too. That is the best image I can give you of one of the greatest things that you can do for your children. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Check, 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 check. There we go. You guys give uh, Randy a hand. Incredibly encouraging and inspiring uh, to get in God's word and to make it such a priority. Well, one of the things that we wanted to communicate to you guys um, this evening is not just the charge, not just the do this, okay? Um, we want you to know as a church uh, that uh, we as, as a staff and leadership are committed to giving you resources in order to help. Uh, so there's two things I want you to be aware of. Um, well, a couple, maybe more than two. Uh, one is this upcoming fall, uh, we are planning uh, as a staff Uh, within the children's department, within the youth department, and with what we're going to offer on Wednesday night to go through what you call Bible storying. um, And that is mapping through and telling the overarching story of the Bible. And for us to do that 
uh, collectively, cohesively at the same time together in the youth department, in the children's department, and what we're offering on Wednesday night, okay? Um, so that is coming. And uh, some of the resources we're using are going to be, if you know, Randy Frazee uh, wrote a uh, uh, an edited version of the Bible that does this overarching story. The whole point of trying to communicate uh, what he described this evening, and that is that sometimes reading your Bible can be complex, and it is fundamental for you to know the story of the Bible so that you can piece certain things together, right? So that when you pick up the book of Isaiah, you're like, what is going on? Versus Jeremiah, like where, what different times these prophets are and some of the difficult things that they're saying and be able to communicate that. So that is coming in the, in the fall. Uh, we as a church are going to be organized and going to roll that out. All of that is to help you, to equip you so that you can feel confident, so that you can do the very thing that is the number one thing about passing down your faith to your children, right? And that is, he's, he said it time and time again, and this is straight from scripture, that your children and grandchildren long to hear those truths from you. They long to hear you engage and share your faith because they trust you, okay? You understand that? They know you and they trust you. You are the first picture of God that they have. And, and so they, this is the way God's wired them, for them to hear that truth from you first. Secondly, um, Coming out of the men's retreat, if you happen to be there, uh, we got the idea that there might be something that we can do and offer this summer. And that is, if this works for your schedule, great, you're invited. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. We'll hit you in the fall with some of that. Um, but Fridays this summer, starting next Friday, not this Friday in two days, a week from two days, up here at the church in the admin building, we're going to have a lunch, a brown sack lunch. Bring your, uh, bring your lunch. And one of the things, and, and what we're going to do during the summer is going to, we're going to walk through how to read your Bible and some of this large format storying of these are the important stories you need to know about your Bible, as well as some basic, like this is good reading, this is good paying attention, and, and really basic level sort of, this is how to understand your Bible. For many of you in this room, that's probably not for you. You've, you've been around church long enough, you have a lot of that piece together. But if you think that, that this might be for you, please, please, please come as well as, if it works with your schedule, as well as invite your friends and your neighbors. We don't want understanding the Bible, understanding those large story formats to prevent uh, people from picking up their Bible, okay? So you know you constantly hear the charge, right? From the pulpit and from church, read your Bible. We also want to equip you and resource you in order to be able to do that. All right. So from noon to one, starting next Friday, bring a brown bag, show up at the admin building this summer. Uh, it, the hope and the aim of that is to be very uh, Q&A um, so that we can engage and just ask super plain, very approachable, accessible, how to read your Bible. Okay. Okay. Um, Randy, do you know, obviously you wrote, but what might be some other helpful resources that you've come across through the years in terms of storying, in terms of helping parents, grandparents along these lines? Yeah, the thing, uh, the thing if you go to the story.com, uh, you will see all the resources. So the beauty of it is that there is a student ver adult version, a student version, and three children's versions. Uh, the version I was reading out of was the middle 
children's version to my granddaughter. And uh, some people will actually learn the upper story or the, the, uh, of the Bible through a children's Bible uh, as well. So the story uh, is an abridged chronology, as Pastor Jason was sharing with you. It's a abridged chronology. It's not a Bible. It is an abridgment of the Bible. Uh, and it takes out all the repetition. It takes 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 and uh, puts Psalm 51 in the same pl- place for you. And we take out all the chapters and verses uh, so that you read it more like a novel. We call it a novel novel experience. I also like uh, the Bible Project. You probably have seen the Bible Project. So if you go to BibleProject.com, I think that is a great way to have a a great introduction. It's all done by uh, marker board art, if you haven't seen it. And it's a fantastic way, and kids are pretty connected to it. We also use art in the story uh, as well. So I think that's going to be a good idea. Those are my thoughts. Awesome. Thank you for that. Now, Randy, uh, this week was a big week for you. In the fact that you just had this come out? Yes, I did. All right, tell us about it. What is it? Okay, so this is a a book that's centered around the book of Philippians. So it's it's from a book of the Bible. It's called The Joy Challenge. And what I've done in the book is I've extracted 20 principles on how to increase your joy despite your circumstances, despite other people, despite your past and a kind of joy that defies or defeats worry. Those are the four chapters in the book of Philippians. And under each chapter, there's five practical principles on how to increase your joy. I call it the joy challenge because joy is a challenge in our day and age, but also I put it into a 25 day challenge because I don't want you to just get smarter on the topic of joy. I want your joy to actually increase. And so it tells, we are told by scientists, it takes 21 days to form a habit. So I'm giving you four extra days to make sure that it <laughs> sticks, right? And so this is I- ideal to do with a friend. Uh, and there's also a free downloadable journal for the experience and a free downloadable joy cube that you're invited to share during the 25 days. The 25 days involves reading the chapter or listening to it. It's an in audio. Number two is doing the assignment or the challenge that you've been given. They're all doable within the day. Number three, you're going to be asked to memorize four scriptures over the course of the 25 days from the book of Philippians, hiding God's word in your heart. And finally, you're going to be asked to review the principles by carrying this cube around with you everywhere you go. So if you're at the workout place or you're at Costco or Walmart or work or on the dashboard of your car, you want to carry it along with you. And two things are going to happen. You're going to review the principles. It's going to etch it into your mind. And inevitably, someone's going to ask you, what in tarnation? Why are you carrying around the cube? Why are you around the cube? And you'll be able to tell them the story. I'm just trying to have a little bit more joy in life. And whenever you share your story with someone else, your joy is going to increase. So I brought. That's to give away, right? I brought a book to give away. And so, Pastor, you have to decide who you like the most. Oh, there we go. Uh, Here's what we'll do. Is today anyone's birthday? Um, It is? Yeah. Well, my next question was who has the nearest birthday? So yesterday, there it is. All right. Awesome. You can get that. All right. We have a few minutes for a few questions. If it, yeah, Randy said he'll sign it for you. If we have uh, any questions for, uh, for Randy or for the implementation of some of the things we're talking about, we have a few minutes for that and then we'll pray and be dismissed. Well, look at that. You guys always have questions after I present. <laughs> yeah, I'm not answering that. Hold on. Mike, Mike had one right here. Yes, sir. The question was, I'll leave this to Randy, because how do we limit the sports? Oh, okay. Uh, Good question. I will answer the question, and no one's going to do it. That's what I've learned. I I have not been able to get very many people to change their minds on this. Okay, so here's what you do. Uh, You, first of all, make a dinner 
the number one thing, the sport has to evolve around dinner. Number two, uh, you don't get super excited about your kids being in highly competitive sports in the early years, particularly. When they get to junior high school, uh, the, 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 the sports are done after school because the teachers and the coaches want to be home for dinner. It's when the kids are super small that they have to be done by volunteers and we have to wait for the volunteers to get off of work. And so you're having your kids out at night during dinner. So they're out there exercising. Uh, you're out there exercising, but because you have no time for dinner, you take them through McDonald's drive through right? So you're trying to get them into shape and this is a failure. This is not really working. Uh, we know that there's a, there's a lot of research that kids are burning out on sports by the age of 13. Uh, by the time the kids are actually biologically ready to play sports, they're burnt out by them. Number two, we also know, and you can watch this wonderful deal uh, by Wayne Gretzky, uh, Pele, and Jerry Rice. It's a great documentary where they're saying, would you let your kids play for crying out loud? Would you let them play? Because if God did not put in them the gift, it's not gonna come out of them by starting them when they're young. Uh, you can, you, you, like Dallas Cowboy, uh, uh, I worked with the guy at the Dallas Cowboys and, and he, I said, uh, man, you must have played sports all your life. He says, I ran track in high school. I go, what did you do? He says, I just went to training camp at the Dallas Cowboys. I like, and you made the team? Yeah, I made the team. Like really, uh, if God puts something in you, engineering, nursing, you know, speech. He's gonna let it come out of him. Don't make every kid. So we, our kids were in, um, our, our three boys were in baseball. We, and, and, uh, we, and our daughter was in softball. And so we have four kids and there's only two of us. So our parenting was reduced to chauffeuring and parenting through chain link fences. And we always missed dinner. And whenever I discovered this, and I discovered this when I hit about of insomnia, and so we had to change things. And I went to the kids because I went to baseball. And I'm not, I mean, hey, listen, I mean, I, I, I love me some baseball, man. Uh, uh, but here's the deal. Uh, our kids were playing all in the infield. And I went and told the coach that, and they're like in second and third grade. I went and told the coach, I said, listen, we're not coming back uh, next, uh, we're, 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 we're not coming uh, for the fall. We're taking fall ball out. And he goes, well, we actually have a summer league too. And I go, well, we're not doing that either. He says, well, when you come back next spring, I can't guarantee that your children will be on the infield. They may be sitting on the bench. So I felt really guilty, right? So we quit. I went home to my boys and I said, um, we're gonna pull you out of baseball. And they said, so we don't have to go to practice three nights a week? I go, no. So we can like stay in the neighborhood and like dig holes in the ground? Yes. Great, I, mean, I thought you liked baseball. And they said, we only did it because you signed us up. Now your kids may be completely different, but don't be, be you've made, the, the whole society is made, designed to make you feel guilty uh, for that. There are sports that we find that are very family friendly in the early elementary school ages. We found basketball to be very friendly. Uh, it's practice on Saturday, games on Saturday afternoon, uh, those kinds of things. It just can't get, it can't, uh, get in place of dinner. You got to protect dinner. So look, make dinner number one. Everything has to evolve around that and believe that your kids are going to probably not be professional athletes. Amen. Uh, they're not going to be professional athletes. They're just not going to, I mean, we've known a lot of families who've tried and we only have one who's actually made it. He plays now for the Colorado Rockies again and he is struggling. He's struggling to stay in it and he's six foot five and he's a beast, you know, huh? Yeah, he's a home run hitter, but he's having a hard time staying in it, right? And his parents had to supplement him in the minor leagues for a long, long time. So uh, give up on that and then look for family-friendly sports, uh, believing that God's going to bring out the best in them uh, when the time has come. For example, my son, uh, I have one son who is a scratch golfer. Uh, he's 33 years old. I've got one son who's 31, who is a national uh, wakeboard champion at Baylor University. Uh, we didn't even grow up on a lake. I'm just telling you folks. And then I have one son that made the track team at Baylor University, turned him down to become a lawyer because God called him to be a lawyer, not an athlete. Okay, does that make sense? So I double dog dare any parents listening to me to make your, your kids sports family friendly around dinner. And if you do, I'll give you a free copy of my book, amen.
Double dog dare. And she took you up on it. Okay. <laughs> there we go. What's your wife's name? Brenda. Brenda? So be Brenda. <laughs> take it up on the dare. There you go. Take them up on the so, dare. There you go. Awesome. Time for one more question. Mike or Bill. Oh, good crap. Oh, <laughs> oh, wow, wow, wow. Don't step in it, just punt, man. Yeah, yeah. So I think Pastor Jason is the best one to answer Yeah, the best question. one to answer. Uh, yeah, um, I, uh, uh, here, you, you're from Cleveland. Oh, yeah. Well, I did not like it uh, when the football team became the Ravens. Yeah, I think the one exception is no, he will not. I'm just joking. Just so you, he will not. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think he'll ever step foot back in Cleveland again. That's for sure, right? Uh, yeah. So I'd be glad to answer that uh, Indian Guardian question with you privately afterwards. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> awesome, church family. Thank you for your attention. And one more time, let's give our special guest a round of applause. Thank you. And, and from one pastor to another, not only thank you for being here this evening, but uh, thank you for answering the call and for living your life with, with faithfulness and a dedication to use all the giftings and equipping that the Lord has given you uh, to equip God's people. And you are, you are a blessing to the church. And so thank you for that. You, Jason. Church family, we're going to pray and then we'll, we will be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Uh, we thank you for the charge of your word to be able to understand it, to be able to piece our Bibles together and to know with confidence, God, that you have wired the family unit this way, that parents and grandparents are calling, our deepest calling is to, is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with our children and, and that we are equipped to do so. And wherever we are in our spiritual walk, uh, that we just need to start. Help us as a church here at First Baptist uh, to, to equip and to resource and to encourage and to come alongside um, and to, uh, to let those parents know that they can do it. Uh, and that prioritizing the spiritual health and life of our, of our children and the next generation is so very important. Father, help us to be a light to our community. Uh, help us to, uh, to fall in love with your son and to walk with him. Uh, help us to do all of that uh, through your grace and through your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.